morning. My name is Keely Brooks, and I'm going to walk you through a couple of housekeeping items before we get started on the hour. Let me see. Uh, this is a this is a screenshot of the attendee interface, uh, and to the left is the GoToWebinar viewer where you will see the presentation. To the right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can ask questions and select audio mode. You can choose to listen through your computer's speaker system or over the phone. If joining over the phone, just select phone call in the audio pane and dial in information will be displayed. You can submit text questions by typing your questions into either the chat or questions pane of the control panel on your right. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we will address them as time allows during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Each presentation will last approximately 15 minutes uh, with the option for clarifying questions uh, if time allows. Uh, however, most of the questions will be responded to at the conclusion of uh, all the presentations. All right, good morning, everyone. It is nine o'clock and want to welcome you all to the 2020 Colorado River Hydrology Research Symposium webinar series. So today is the last of a three-part series of webinars. The first was held on October 8th regarding new models and data to inform water supply forecasts, and the second was held on October 19th called Prospects for Advancing Hydroclimatic, Hydroclimate Prediction at Seasonal and Longer Time Scale. My name is Seth Shanahan, and I'm a Colorado River Programs Manager for the Southern Nevada Water Authority. And today's webinar and the past webinars are brought to you by both SNWA and our partners from the Colorado River Climate and Hydrology Workgroup. And today's webinar particularly is focused on decision science. Next slide. So I want to bring to you all's attention this work group of folks known as the Colorado River Climate and Hydrology Work Group, as represented by the um, uh, uh, icons on this slide here. Uh, this group of folks represents uh, membership from across the seven Colorado River Basin states, uh, as well as large water utilities and federal partners such as the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, and NASA. And this group has been around for a few years. You might remember participating in a symposium in Las Vegas in 2017. And so this is the next symposium in that series, essentially, from that group of folks that originally started talking about them. Now, this group um, is really just a willing coalition of folks who are interested in advancing some understanding of climate and hydrology information and using it better in the basin. Um, and wanted just to point to the goal that this group has, and it's specifically to advance the scientific understanding to improve the accuracy of hydrologic forecasts and projections, to enhance the performance of some predictive tools, and to better understand the uncertainty related to future supply and demand conditions in the Colorado River Basin. Next slide. So one of the first projects that this work group pursued was to work with our partners at Western Water Assessment to prepare the Colorado River Basin Climate and Hydrology State of the Science Report. Um, so the, the work group uh, funded this project that was ultimately published in the spring of this year. And I just really wanna say thank you. I know we've got some folks on the line uh, particularly Jeff Lucas and Liz Payton over at Western Water Assessment, who led the development of this project and this report. And also many of you who are out there, I'm sure, who were either contributors to this report or reviewers or involved in some way. And so I'm bringing the State of the Science report up because as a work group, we recognized that the first thing really we needed to do was to understand the lay of the land, the basic um, state of knowledge and state of science as we call it uh, 
with um, this topic of, <clears throat> pardon me, climate and hydrology in the basin. And so this document really lays the foundation for everything that we know. It includes things related to the modeling tools and the chain of models that are used for the decision support in the basin to fundamental science um, issues associated with hydrology and, and climate as well. And one of the topics though that wasn't included in the state of the science, and we recognize as a work group that really not every single topic could be, was this topic of decision science. And I really want to um, uh, just read off quickly a quote from the State of the Science report that I think summarizes and tees up today's webinar in a great way. So here it is. So water resource practitioners in the basin are trying to make the best decisions possible about infrastructure operations and demand management, given the uncertainty in future water supply. Studies to, su to support decision making in this new environment are beginning to explore alternative analytical approaches that address the lack of information about the future by first evaluating system sensitivities, vulnerabilities, and future, or excuse me, failure modes. This emerging paradigm is reflected in the decision making under deep uncertainty movement. And this was addressed, like I said, um, uh, just in, in very small part with, um, with that quote and, and a little bit more detail in the State of the Science report. And it acknowledged how, how much uncertainty there is in, um, in the future. And so today's present, uh, set of presentations is really to uh, take a topic that wasn't provided much attention and d dive deep into what decision science is how could it potentially be used? How, how has it been used? And have a conversation about that. So I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. And that is Dr. Rebecca Smith. She's an engineer with the Lower Colorado Basin Region of Reclamation and a member of the modeling and research team stationed at the University of Colorado Boulder's Center for Advanced Decision Support for Water and Environmental Systems. She coordinates the region's Colorado River Basin Research to Operations Program and uses her background in decision-making under deep uncertainty to contribute to planning and policy studies. So I wanna thank Dr. Smith for moderating the session and pass it over to you, so thanks. And Rebecca, if you're speaking, you are on mute. Ah, I did that. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks, Ed, and thanks, Keely, for doing all the organization. And, and I'll point out that if you provide a bio to someone, they have to call you doctor. So that was a really great way to start my morning. The session today will introduce the concept of deep uncertainty, describe how this uncertainty creates challenges for long-term planning in the Colorado River Basin, and present planning frameworks that address the challenges. Reclamation will review techniques used in the 2012 Basin Study, and other speakers will, will present recent work that builds on those techniques. Throughout the presentations, please remember to enter any questions you have in the chat or question box and select Send to Staff from the drop-down menu. The uh, agenda for today is that I'm gonna introduce Deep Uncertainty then David Groves and Alan Butler will do a co-presentation that uh, introduced robust decision-making and how it was employed during the Basin study. Dr. Joseph Kasprizik will then describe many objective robust decision-making and Elia Alexander will describe our research project that we recently completed, which uses MORDM in a Lake Mead policy planning context. And then, uh, if you have questions throughout the presentations that are clarifying questions, we'll try to get to those after the individual presentations, but otherwise we'll have Q&A and discussion after all the present presentations are complete. All right, next slide, please. That's me. Next slide, please. Okay. My job is to introduce and define some concepts and motivate why they're important for our planning in the Colorado River Basin. And hopefully, once I'm through, you'll um, have a good primer for understanding the rest of the presentations which build on these concepts. Next slide, please. So I'll define deep uncertainty. I'll review the factors in the Colorado River Basin that support thinking about our context in terms of deep uncertainty. 
go into a little bit of the implications of deep uncertainty for our long-term planning, and then introduce concepts underlying decision-making for deep uncertainty, or DMD. Next slide, please. Deep uncertainty exists when parties do not know or cannot agree on the most appropriate system models and or how to value different measures of system performance and or probability distributions of key external conditions. And so what that really looks like for our basin is that we have multiple management objectives that sometimes conflict and we have many sources of projections of future hydrology and demand. I'm going to talk briefly about those multiple objectives and then spend a, more of our time talking about uncertain hydrology. Next slide, please. Okay, so as with all river basins, the Colorado River supports many resources, water supply, hydropower, environment, recreation, culture, flood control. And when we think about that in a planning context, um, you know, like a technical planning context, that means we have multiple management objectives. We want to deliver water, we want to store water, and we want to release water. And we have other non-flow considerations like temperature, water quality, and sediment. And so this isn't groundbreaking analysis, but the point is that we have multiple objectives, many perspectives, and there's no one best way to operate the system. And this is part of deep uncertainty when there are different objectives and multiple views. And so that's something we um, delve into every time we do a study in planning. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna talk about our different hydrology ensembles. We have things derived from the past. So the observed record is the past. Our full hydrology record spans 1906 to the present, and it is represented in the blue box plot and the blue blob, which is a distribution of annual flows at Lee's Ferry. And that distribution gives a little more information than the box plot. Our early pluvial removed uh, record spans 1931 to the present. And this was created because we recognized that in the early 20th century, we had you know, pretty consistently pretty high flows and they resulted from a cooler, wetter period that is not quite representative of what we've seen since. And so we said, well, if we truncate the record, then we'll you know, have a slightly different record and that will um, you know, maybe give us a slightly different view that we believe might better represent what's happening now. And the stress test spans 1988 to the present and um, that's represented in the yellow, the dark yellow distribution. And this is a, another iteration of that truncating the record to more closely represent what we've been experiencing recently. So it's warmer, we've been in drought for a long time. And this um, is a little bit closer to the things we've been experiencing. So as you can see, the yellow and green distributions are shifted lower than the full hydrologic record. We also have ensembles derived from tree rings. The direct paleo record was reconstructed from 762 to 2005, and you can see that in the gray distribution, which has a very rich variety of annual East Ferry flows. There, is, there are flows that are lower than what we've observed, and, um, but you know, the, the largest part of that distribution is kind of near our full hydrology record, but what these distributions don't capture is the sequence of annual flows. So, the paleo record does have longer droughts and you know longer wet spells and this is important information about what the basin has experienced and could experience in the future and we also have the paleo conditioned ensemble which combines statistical sampling techniques and that paleo record and that's represented in the light yellow which is a little more constrained to observed annual flow volumes and has a kind of a wild annual distribution but again it gives us more variety and sequences of annual hydrology. Next slide, please. We also have ensembles derived from future climate projections. Our coupled model intercomparison project phase three or CMIP three ensemble covers three global future scenarios and we have 112 model projections downscale to our basin. And that is represented in the red distribution. And the high range, end of the range is really, really high and that is interesting. Um, and then there's a lot of variety of other annual flows, uh, but the most prominent flows are shifted a little lower than our observed hydrologic record. 
And then the CMIP-5 ensemble covers four future hydrologic, or sorry, four global future emissions or concentration pathway scenarios. And we have 97 model projections downscaled for our basin. And that's represented in the tealish green color. And again, those highs are even higher than CMIP-3. The rest of the distribution looks kind of similar, but what we see in these two climate change scenarios is that the models don't agree. Even the two you know, distributions between the CMIP experiments don't agree. And furthermore, they look different from all of the other ensembles. And that's, that's the point of this figure and everything I've been talking about for the last five minutes is that all of the ensembles are different. They have different sources, different characteristics, and science can't tell us which of these is right. Science can't tell us which models to believe and not believe. And so, you know, that is uncertainty. That's deep uncertainty. And um, we've used various combinations of these different ensembles in various studies since development of the guidelines. And that also goes to show how there is no perfect set of hydrology for every study. Next slide, please. So the hydrology is different, and then once we put that through CRSS, it also makes risk look different. On the left, we have those same distributions we saw previously, the stress test, the full observed record, and CMIP-3. And on the right, we have a projection of probability of going below mead, mead going below 1025 in December between now and 2026. As you can see, the risk kind of unfolds differently. CMIP-5, or excuse me, CMIP-3 jumps out to higher risk initially, but stress test surpasses that by 2026. And the observed record, the full observed record kind of stays low. And so we have three different views of what is the probability of like me falling below 1025. Next slide, please. And that difference in risk gets even bigger when you look further out. This figure shows the same three projections out through 2060 from the August 2020 CRSS run. And each of these lines represents assumptions about hydrology demand and policy going into the future. Next slide, please. And what, in reality, there are infinite lines capturing assumptions about these three things. And these lines are hypothetical numbers that I just made up, but they could perfectly well represent a different set of assumptions. And the reality is we have no way to know which is the best set of assumptions. What exactly should we be planning for in the future? And thus, we are in a deep uncertainty situation. Next slide, please. But it doesn't mean we're hopeless. And it just means we need to look for different types of information to support planning. And that's where decision-making under deep uncertainty or DMDU methods come into play. So they incorporate concepts and techniques that help address this problem of how can we choose a set of assumptions. And they also help address the fact that we have multiple planning objectives and multiple perspectives in this basin. So there are two important concepts I want to tee up. First is robustness. What, is, what does it mean to be robust in our planning context? Well, first, we want to test the system under a wide range of future conditions. And we don't care what ensemble they came from. It, it doesn't matter. We want to just test the system under a wide range of conditions and then identify plans and policies that perform acceptably well across that range. They are unlikely to be optimal for any subset of hydrology, but the point is we want to be okay. We want to think we're going to be okay in this really wide range of futures. And so then the last thing is vulnerability-based analysis. Rather than only thinking about, well, what is the probability of some bad thing happening that is dependent on the hydrology we chose? it is helpful to think, okay, how can we learn what external conditions cause us to be performing poorly or cause our system to be vulnerable? And so, you know, what has the flow been for the last five years? Where, is, where are the reservoirs right now? That allows us to create signposts that provide early warning that we may be entering a vulnerable phase and then monitor those external conditions to be better prepared for a really uncertain future. Next slide, please. So hopefully 
I've teed up concepts and you can go into these next presentations with some background and the rest of the presentations will kind of build on methods and applications and I uh, don't need to read through all these but um, we teed up the presentations and I'm really excited to spend the rest of this morning talking about one of my favorite technical topics. So with that, I am done presenting, but we have one question, which is, why does paleo conditioned have a unique low end tail? Um, I am not an expert in that, but let me, Let's, let's table it for the discussion, and I bet Alan will have a good answer for that, and um, we'll get to it. Thanks, DK. So next is Dr. David Groves, and um, he's a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation and professor in policy analysis at the Party RAND Graduate School. He co-directs RAND's Climate Resilience Center and Center on Decision Making Under Uncertainty. His work focuses on assisting government agencies and organizations to develop strategies that will be robust to the uncertain future. He has worked with the Bureau of Reclamation on the 2012 Colorado River Basin Study and a science and technology project on DMDU that is um, providing DMDU planning context for a wide audience. During this presentation, we will also hear from Alan Butler. Alan is a hydrologic engineer with the Bureau of Reclamation's Lower Colorado Basin Region, and he's also stationed at the University of Colorado Center for Advanced Decision Support for Water and Environmental Systems, or CATS West. Alan was part of the Colorado River Basin Study technical team, where he led the river remodeling efforts and for the study. He is a former CATS West graduate student, and that is where he earned his MS in civil engineering. And Dr. David Groves is up. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be uh, joining this webinar. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Rebecca, and all the context uh, that you set um, that will make my presentation go uh, smoothly. Um, what I'd like to talk about is really um, just describe a little bit more about DMDU, maybe just approach some of the same concepts that Rebecca mentioned, but just from a slightly different angle. Sometimes it's great to hear these new concepts in a couple different times, but I'll go through that quickly. Uh, then I'll highlight a particular methodology, robust decision making, which um, uh, we used in uh, in support of the 2012 Colorado River Basin study. Uh, then I'm going to pass it over to Alan, and Alan is going to then talk through the actual um, application of that method to um, the Colorado River Basin study. And then I'm going to come back and say a few more words about where, where one could take um, this type of analysis going forward. Um, so with that, uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, the, the, the overarching question that we're facing here is, you know, how do we manage water systems when we can't perfectly predict the future? And, and Rebecca did a nice motivation with, with uh, um, the, uh, you know, nice information about uh, potential, uh, you know, the historical record of the, of the Colorado River hydrology as well as projections in the future. And it's clear that we're, we just can't say with certainty um, how, how the uh, hydrologic system might be changing. Um, yet we still need to make uh, decisions in the near term, uh, both to address current challenges that, that we face on the, on the river, um, as well as um, emerging ones coming up. Uh, next slide. So the traditional planning methods, as, as we're all familiar with, um, you know, generally fo follow a, a typical pattern where we, you know, agree or characterize the future conditions. That's often the historical hydrology. We assume that that historical hydrology will repeat itself in the future. Um, we then use our models and analysis to identify what would be the optimal type of management um, approach in this, uh, you know, to address those conditions. Um, you know, of course, the, those conditions could also be combined with forward projections of demand and, and other other trends, of course. But this, still the principle is trying to understand, well, what would be the, the best thing to do? What would minimize cost and achieve all our objectives, et cetera? Um, and then oftentimes we uh, acknowledge that there's some, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty even within, the, you know, that, those projections. And so we can do a sensitivity analysis. And this works when we can agree on what the future conditions or the statistical characteristics of those future conditions could be. Um, uh, but when we can't, um, you know, it's, it's more difficult. So 
Um, you know, in, in today's world, we're, we're increasingly recognizing that there's um, deep uncertainty uh, affecting our decision making and water management. Um, and this is just another way of describing deep uncertainty in the, uh, that Rebecca presented. Um, so one aspect is when uncertainty about the future is not easily characterized and here are a bunch of reasons why these these kinds of trends are, are difficult um, and developing a probability distribution function really becomes a judgment and and uh, you know in, in some respects has ethical um, implications because depending on what P, PDF you choose you know whichever hydrology you choose to use um, then has implications in the decisions that you make and and the impacts on different types of people uh, advance please and then on the flip side there's also the multiple objectives and and uh, needs of of the stakeholders and you know in this case of course you've got urban agriculture environmental recreation you know all these different interests um, that we need to balance and so it's not obvious what objective function we can use to come up with a a perfect solution or an optimal solution uh, or water management strategy so decision making under deep uncertainty is you know it's it's an emerging decision science subfield it has its own society called the society for decision making under deep uncertainty you can learn all about it at deepuncertainty.org um this the you know this research community now has a has a book um by published by springer and you can um, find it by googling dmdu springer um and in this uh in this book it describes a variety of different approaches to doing this type of um you know analytical work and and policy research um there are some case studies related to water um so there's actually a, a telling of the colorado river basin study application which alan is going to get in, into in a little bit but there are also some others um and this is a really great reference if you want to really dig into the you know both the you know literature motivation for this field and and kind of come up to speed with uh, you know all the different types of approaches that are being used across the world um next slide Robust decision making is just one flavor of decision making under deep uncertainty, and you're going to hear a little bit more. Uh, well, you're going to hear hear about multi um, multi objective RDM or um, MORDM, which is a you know an elaboration or or sort of a development of this method to to address um, you know different aspects of the decision problem. Um, uh, so anyway, the point is is that RDM is is kind of one way to think about it. Um, we think it's a very generalizable approach so we often you know describe this kind of research around an rdm framework um so what rdm does is it really brings um you know the, sometimes we call it the missing machinery for systematic shareable reasoning under deep uncertainty so it, it provides a structure for that or analyzing a um a decision problem when you have all of this uncertainty and it has a couple of elements it it brings in, um, you know, it uses computation, computational power to look at many, many scenarios. It, it brings in um, interactive visualizations to support um, interactions or work um, dialogue or deliberation with stakeholders. And, and again, the objective, as Rebecca mentioned, is to really identify robust plans. And these are or robust strategies. And these are, you know, strategies that are going to perform well regardless of how the um, future unfolds um, we often talk about it in this sort of wheel like structure where we start with the decision framing step and then go through these other steps which i'll briefly mention now um, next slide so the you know as with any planning process there's always the you know the framing step at the beginning of the analysis to determine what you want to analyze and to receive input from stakeholders and decision makers um, i think one thing that that, or one approach RDM often RDM studies often uses is, is using something we call an XLRM matrix, which is essentially a, a tool for eliciting from stakeholders and decision making what are the what are the major aspects of the decision problem that we need to analyze. And by disaggregating it into these four categories, um, it really helps structure the analysis. So you know, understanding what are the key uncertainties that that decision makers or or, or stakeholders are concerned about, whether it's climate change or changes in, in water uses or demands or technology innovation, things like that. Um, what are the options or strategies that we think we could possibly um, consider at this point, recognizing that we might then de develop some new options as we go through the analysis, those are the L's. Um, the M's, the performance metrics. So um, again, we're often dealing with multiple ob objectives um, in these kinds of analyses. So really teasing out what 
people really want to see in the in outcomes um, is important. And then lastly, relationships. Um, this gets to all the technical information, those hydrologic sequences that Rebecca showed, the model like CRSS, um, as, as well as other, other models that might you know, project demand, for instance, you're bringing those all together. So understanding, coming, coming to a common understanding of all those elements is, is the first step of an RDM study. Next slide. Um, then what we do is we look at a wide range of futures. So this is um, not trying to predict one you know what, what the most likely condition is, but rather say what could the, what could happen in the basin, and so we we do this by um, you know developing uh, different projections and modeling them through our you know our integrated system. I just have a little schematic of of what this could look like for a water planning agency. Um, so this is a schematic for a, a study that we did with with your uh, with, with Metropolitan Water District. Um, next slide. You know, once we've analyzed or once we've evaluated all these potential futures, um, then we uh, need to figure out how do we interpret that information. And so RDM relies, as, as Rebecca mentioned, on a vulnerability analysis, which the idea is let's understand not let's not say which futures are the most likely. Rather, let's understand which futures lead our system to perform the way we want it to perform or which conditions lead their system to not perform well. So you could think about Lake Mead elevation as, as a criteria for determining whether or not the system is performing well. If it drops below you know, one of the many thresholds, you could say, well, we wanna understand what conditions or what would you need to believe in order for Lake Mead to fall below that threshold. And so we use different um, algorithms to uh, do this uh, analysis and, and Alan will, will showcase a little bit of that in his slides. Um, next slide. Once we go through subsequent iterations of identifying vulnerabilities, we might then develop new strategies um, and eventually we are faced with some trade-offs trying to balance different uh, balance, uh, you know, how our strategies perform across our different metrics or uh, perform under different um, uh, vulnerabilities. And through an iterative process, we can get things that are more robust, meaning perform well across a broader range of, of futures as well as across a broader range of perspectives. Um, and so this, the, um, this is just an example, um, you know, trade off in terms of cost and, and reliability uh, for a case study in Monterey, Mexico. Next slide. And then lastly, the final result is a robust strategy um, advance. Um, and, and the key here is that it's um, often ad, um, adaptive, meaning it, in, it consists of some things that we do now that we can generally agree are low regret, meaning you know, good things to do regardless of how the future unfolds. And then there are some um, indicators that would, or signposts that would, would, would tell us that we need to do additional, um, take additional actions in order to um, perform well in the future that, that is unfolding. Um, and I'm gonna come back and talk about that a little bit after Alan speaks. Uh, next slide. So um, these these studies they they're pro they're supported by interactive planning support tools and really this is just recognizing that these kind of analyses can't really be done in you know by a single analyst on a computer in a in a back room it really has to be it really is supporting a, a deliberative process and so that means that you know you're running your models you know hundreds of thousands of times um, collecting these database you know large or developing large databases of cases and then we need to interact or bring that into some interactive visualization software to support the conversations around the information and so this is a little schematic um, showing that um, that process next slide um, and so just to summarize, you know, the key elements uh, are to evaluate strategies across many plausible futures, define key vulnerabilities, develop iter uh, iteratively develop robust and adaptive strategies, and then use this information to inform deliberations over key trade-offs. And here are a couple of some of the early work that, um, that, that motivates uh, a lot of the DMDU field. Next slide. And there are a bunch of, um, we've, we've applied, or many people have applied this in many contexts. Um, I think I'm just gonna move right now to taking it over to Alan, who, and he's gonna talk about the application of this method uh, in the Colorado River Basin study. And I'll come back in a few minutes and finish up my, my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to speak to you and provide you an example of how we use the robust decision-making framework or parts of it in the 2012 Colorado River Basin Water Supply and Demand Study. Next slide, please. 
I'm going to start by outlining the approach that we took in the basin study very quickly. Then I'll go into how we applied RDM in our system reliability analysis, and then conclude with how we developed portfolios and then continue to apply some of those RDM concepts to the portfolio assessment. Next slide. All right, to refresh you all, uh, the 2012 Basin Study had two main objectives. The first was to assess the future water supply and demand imbalances over the next 50 years. And the second was then to develop and evaluate opportunities for resolving those imbalances. The study was a planning study. We didn't make any decisions, but it did provide a technical foundation for future activities, many of which we're continuing to evolve and rely on today. The study was conducted by Reclamation and the seven uh, basin states in collaboration with many other stakeholders throughout the basin. And we had a contracting team that consisted of uh, CHGM Hill, which is now Jacobs, and of course the Rand Corporation, of which Dave was an integral piece of that. Next slide. The study was broken up into four phases. Uh, the first two phases were the water supply and demand assessment. I'll quickly touch on those in the coming slides. The, then there was the third phase, which was the system reliability analysis, which I'll spend the bulk of my time uh, speaking about. And finally, our fourth phase looked at the development and evaluation of opportunities to uh, mitigate the supply demand imbalance. And that was conducted in the fourth phase. And we'll touch on um, that in the, at the end of the presentation. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the first two phases of the project were the quantification of the water supply and demand scenarios. Rebecca already introduced uh, many of water supply scenarios that we have available to us. We used four of those in the basin study, which are listed here. Uh, the full observed hydrology, the paleo, um, the full paleo record, the paleo conditioned, and the CMIP-3, which we refer to as the downscale GCM projected supply scenario in the basin study. Uh, additionally, we quantified six different demand scenarios. We did this by quantifying uh, parameter level data uh, things like irrigated acreage for the agricultural sector and population and per capita water use for the municipal sector for three different uh, time periods in the future and then use those um, to quantify demand scenarios going out 50 years. And we changed those different parameters in the future based on four different storylines uh, that had stories with how these different parameters might change in the future based on you know, current projected or slow growth, rapid growth, or enhanced environments. Um, when we've finished quantifying these supply and demand scenarios, you can see in the figure on the right, we um, had a range of potential future conditions that might exist. Uh, the range of blue shows the range of potential future supply, while that orange shaded region shows the range of future demands. Um, while it's increasing, uh, there's uh, still quite a bit of uncertainty with how much the demand might increase in the future. And so then uh, we needed to understand the timing and location and resources that were affected by these future water supply demand um, uncertainties better. So that's where we performed our system reliability analysis. Next slide. First, our system reliability analysis, we simulated the system for the next 50 years and we did this using CRSS as Dave and Rebecca both mentioned. And then to understand um, where we were vulnerable, we, we developed uh, metrics for six different resource categories, which are listed here, and then identified vulnerability thresholds for each of these metrics, which was um, levels that were deemed unacceptable if, if the metric fell either below or above the particular threshold. And we conducted this vulnerability assessment for um, a wide range of these different metrics for the different resource categories. Uh, and then for some of those uh, metrics, we went ahead and, and performed these last two steps, which was to identify vulnerable conditions and then develop signposts. Um, and the vulnerable conditions are, as Dave described, these different um, ways of describing when this particular metric might be vulnerable. And I'll go through an example of that uh, on the next slide. And once we know those vulnerable conditions, then we could hunt for signposts which were these precursors that the system might become vulnerable if um, you observe the signpost. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to talk to you an example of how we apply this. Um, as I mentioned before, we uh, looked at what the important system variables were for the different resource categories. 
Uh, the example I'm going to use here is the lake mead pool elevation, which is a water supply uh, metric. And that's what's shown in this figure here are the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile projections for Lake Mead's pole elevation going out from 2012 to 2060. Um, and then we identified the critical thresholds for this, for the variables for this particular example. We selected uh, elevation 1000. So if Lake Mead falls below elevation 1000, uh, then this, then the system or this particular metric is vulnerable. And for certain metrics, uh, you needed to cross that um, threshold multiple times or maybe for a period of years. Uh, but for this one, we deemed the, um, the future vulnerable if it falls below that uh, instance once. Uh, so this, this figure shows the combination of all of those different water supply and demand scenarios that we had, as well as two different assumptions for how Lake Powell and Lake Mead are operated post-2026. And so in total, we had 48 different scenarios uh, which are shown here. Many of them are grayed out. Uh, there's there's a few that are highlighted in five different colors just to bring them forward. Um, the particular scenarios don't matter for this example purpose, but you can see here this would be uh, analogous to the to the risk plots that Rebecca uh, used to motivate this. Um, and you could easily translate this or process the data differently to get those risk plots. For example, uh, you can see that that blue scenario falls below elevation a thousand uh, over 50 percent of the time from 2050 to 2060. And so while this is important and, and good information and, and you can learn a lot by looking at these different um, particular scenarios and how they might affect risk in the future, we did want to extend uh, this analysis and complement it by using the RDM type approach where instead of looking at these on a per scenario basis, which this figure does, we throw all of the different futures uh, in one giant bin and then look at um, what what particular futures are vulnerable. Next slide, please. And so um, we extended this to this vulnerability analysis. So this particular figure um, is still for the, the, the Lake Mead falling below elevation 1000 example. And we've gone through um, all of these different scenarios. There's, uh, each, there's 48 scenarios, but it results in about 24,000 different future um, sequences. And we've categorize each one of those future sequences as either vulnerable or not vulnerable. If it's vulnerable, it shows up as a red dot in this figure. And if it um, is, if it's vulnerable, it's a red dot. If it's not vulnerable, it's a gray dot. And then using some of those techniques that Dave uh, mentioned, we searched through many different um, variables to try to find variables that accurately describe when the system would be vulnerable. And for this uh, particular metric, which is Lake Mead falling below elevation 1000, we've found that if the least ferry long-term average natural flow is less than 15 million acre feet, and the driest eight-year drought period is less than 13 million acre feet, then it's very likely that Lake that you would be vulnerable or that Lake Mead would fall below elevation 1000. And you can see here that there are instances where there's red dots that are outside of this um, tan region. So those would be instances that were vulnerable that don't meet this um, description. But the techniques that we used, um, as Dave described, maximize this density. So you're trying to, to maximize the true positives, the, the vulnerable conditions existing in this tan region, while minimizing your false positives and false negatives. And so um, you, could, you could possibly increase that long-term average flow threshold up above 15 million acre feet, but then you would end up um, having a lot more false positives. And so um, based on this, we can, we can then develop signposts to help predict, um, for instance, that we might be approaching an eight year drought of 13 million acre feet and use that to, to come up with some particular action. Um, we can also extend this to evaluate the effectiveness of our portfolios. And so that's where we'll go next, but a quick side note on what the portfolios actually are. So next slide, please. Uh, the portfolios were developed um, to be groupings of many different options. And so during the, the study, we solicited options from the public. Uh, we had 150 different uh, options submitted that essentially um, most of them increased the supply or reduced the demand uh, somehow. An example would be uh, building a desalination plant would increase the supply while um, implementing some form of agricultural or municipal conservation would decrease the demand. Uh, 
Uh, so then we characterized each of these potential options based on things like cost, uh, technical feasibility, uh, the permitting hurdles you might face, et cetera. And then we used those to uh, group the options together in four different strategies to come up with four different portfolios. And we just called those portfolios A, B, C, and D. Um, and there were some strategies about how we went about selecting which options might be part of those um, portfolios. Uh, where portfolio A kind of included almost all of the, the potential options, whereas portfolio D was a very selective few that were deemed very uh, feasible in the near term with low permitting issues. And then there were two others, um, B and C, that had these different high reliability and environmentally preferred type uh, backings behind them. Uh, so each portfolio had a unique combination of options that it could select from, and we developed these and modeled these in such a way that the options were uh, started dynamically during the simulations based on the signposts that were based on those vulnerable conditions I just met. So you weren't starting these options, you weren't implementing a desalination plant and turning on a desalination plant unless you uh, thought that the system was going to be vulnerable in the, um, in the foreseeable future. And so then we can use some of those techniques I just mentioned to evaluate the effectiveness of these portfolios. Next slide, please. Uh, so this figure uh, shows one of those ways that we were able to evaluate the uh, effectiveness of these portfolios. This figure is still for the same example, which is Lake Mead falling below elevation 1000. And the top row of the figure is the same scatter plot that we discussed two slides previously. Um, and then the next two rows are uh, the the results of these two, um, the simulations from these two portfolios. And we've gone through those results and recategorized each of those futures as either vulnerable or not vulnerable. And you can see that in both portfolio A and portfolio B, there's less red dots, meaning less vulnerable uh, futures. Um, what you can also see is, is illustrated by this dashed blue line is that if you were to redraw these, these boxes of vulnerable conditions, the driest eight year drought that um, would would maximize the the coverage of these vulnerable futures would shift to the left by about a half a million acre feet. So what this means is that by implementing these options um, in portfolios A and B, we've essentially reduced that vulnerable space by um, uh, an eight year average half a million acre foot uh, drop down to 12.5 million acre feet. And so then you can begin the conversation about whether or not implementing all those actions, um, you know, was worth that that half a million acre foot reduction in eight year droughts. Um, but this shows just one way that, that we could evaluate the effectiveness of the portfolios. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so then you can move on to talking about uh, the trade-offs associated with um, implementing these portfolios. And so uh, as I I think I mentioned earlier, we did do this vulnerability assessment for multiple different metrics. So this result, or this figure is showing the results for two different metrics. I'm going to focus on the right column, which is still this Lake Mead full elevation falling below elevation 1,000 feet. And one of the trade-offs that we looked into was the trade-off between the reduction in vulnerabilities uh, versus the cost of implementing all these options within the portfolios. And so if you look at the upper right corner, um, you can see that in the baseline, uh, there were about 19% of future years that were vulnerable that where Lake Mead fell below elevation 1000. And that by implementing all of these portfolios, you could reduce that down to uh, somewhere below 6% for each of those portfolios. And this is great. Um, and then there's an associated cost associated with each one of those portfolios. But we also recognize that there's really a subset of these future years that we're really concerned with, the, the dry years, the, the futures that include droughts that we may not have um, observed in the past, instances like that that are really where um, we want to understand how well these portfolios did at, at mitigating those, those particular vulnerabilities. So we subset the data down and looked at only uh, some of these driest uh, potential futures, and that's uh, what's shown in this very bottom row, and where you can actually start to see some uh, interesting trade-offs between the portfolios. So if you look in that lower right corner, um, looking at some of these driest potential futures, you can see into the baseline, uh, you might have 71% of future years that are vulnerable. Um, but by implementing these different portfolios, you've reduced that down to, to less than 30% for portfolios C and D, and less than 15% for portfolios A and B. 
but you can then see trade-offs between these portfolios. So for example, uh, portfolio A and B both reduce the vulnerabilities uh, similarly, yet uh, portfolio B does this for uh, lower cost. And finally, if you compare uh, between this lower right corner in the figure and the lower left, which is a different metric, you can start to see some trade-offs between the metrics. So for example, this um, first column, portfolio C, uh, does particularly well. It reduces the vulnerabilities quite a bit for the cheapest. Um, however, for the Lake Mead vulnerability, it's portfolio B that, um, that reduces the vulnerabilities for the quite a bit for the cheapest. And so you can start to um, look at trade-offs between uh, both potential future solutions and across different metrics or different resources. And um, with that, I will go ahead and uh, turn it back over to Dave uh, to wrap up our portion. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so let me just wrap up with a couple minutes just to talk a little bit more about um, sort of the last, some of the last steps of, of uh, an RDM study, which is, you know, developing that robust strategy. So the, you know, the Basin study looked at a couple of different portfolios and those portfolios were, uh, and the implementation of those portfolios were informed by the vulnerability analysis. But I just want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on that process. So, you know, the idea is we want to, at the end of the day, come up with a, a robust strategy. Again, um, next slide, please. Uh, a robust strategy often consists of um, a, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, perfect. Um, a set of low regret near-term actions. So these are, uh, well, let me say that, uh, low, low regret near-term actions and then signposts that essentially tell us um, when we might need to implement additional actions and then different sets of deferred continued actions. And the question is, well, how do we define these from the analysis? So the low regret near-term actions are really um, often identified as those actions that seem to be good choices across many of those, you know, futures that you've evaluated. So, you know, maybe a certain level of, of efficiency is, is always a good idea. So that could be a low regret near-term action, for instance. Um, the signposts and monitoring for adaptation, this, this comes, this is information that comes from the vulnerability analysis. So in the, in the basin study, um, you know, Alan described those, the, the vulnerabilities, uh, uh, the conditions that would lead to Lake Mead being below a thousand feet elevation. Um, so uh, the analysis tells us sort of what stream flow conditions uh, and over what time period would, would indicate that that condition might happen. And so you can develop a signpost around that that kind of information. And then the deferred continued actions are what the model tells you you would need to do if you were facing those, those conditions. Next slide. Um, so there are a variety of different ways to do this. I'm just gonna highlight one, uh, just give you an example of one, which it's a little technical, um, and so, but the idea is that we use some algorithms to identify um, you know, how different, you know, how different optimal um, investment paths, um, you know, uh, how, how they how they differ from one another and then how you can use um, you know signposts to know which one to follow so uh, I'm going to skip this because I don't think I have enough time to go through the details so let me just show an example next slide so the idea is that you might have um, you know for each future that we've evaluated um, we can identify well what sorts of investments are required for that future and then you can essentially group those that information um, across a your different uncertainty dimensions. So here's just an example of two uncertainties, uncertainty A and B, and it's showing that if uncertainties A and B are up in the upper left, then portfolio X is the, is the, the those are the type of actions you'd need to take. If it's down below in the red area, then you do portfolio Z and then portfolio Y and the other one um, advance. And so what this type of algorithm does is it can take that information and then automatically, or you know, through, through, through the um, algorithm, determine what sorts of conditions lead you to change from portfolio X to portfolio Y or portfolio Z. And that information allows you to build a decision tree. And, and this is actually really powerful. And, and we use this next slide in a, in a recent study that you can um, skip this, please. Um, a recent study uh, looking at developing an optimal management strategy, or sorry, a robust management strategy in Monterey, Mexico. And, and so what the analysis did was it, it identified um, a 
a series of different adaptive strategies that the stakeholders could choose uh, among. But the strategies look to like this decision tree on the right. And I don't have an interactive version here, although you could plug in that URL there and, and, and play around with it. But essentially, um, it starts with an initial selection. And if you mouse over that little node, you'll see that that includes about you know seven or 10 different management strategies that were determined to be um, low regret. And then, and then as you go to the right in time, you see signposts and that's, that sort of indicate those, those signposts are all about the, how demand is evolving over the coming, um, you know, five to seven years. And if it, if it's increasing very heavily, then you go on, you know, the lower branches, if it's increasing less, you go on a higher branch. And then you see there's another signpost that's related to groundwater. And then you get to a set of actions that depending on how those signposts played out, then you need to invest in additional things. And so what this, what this does is this provides a way of, allowing the basin or in this case the, the Monterey Mexico to understand what it needs to do now um, but then also remain and retain the flexibility it needs in order to ensure um, you know reasonable outcomes across a wide range of futures and that's essentially what a robust strategy is um, and I think that's my time so I will stop there. Thanks Dave that was just about to cut you off so <laughs> um, and thanks to Dave and Alan for giving us kind of a an overview and a detailed look at just uh, how RDM can be applied. And now moving on, we're going to hear from Dr. Joseph Kasprizik. Joseph Kasprizik is an associate professor in the Civil Environmental and Architectural Engineering Department from the University of Colorado Boulder. His research advances risk-based decision support and optimization tools applied broadly to planning problems in water resources, environmental management, and infrastructure. He earned his PhD from Pennsylvania State University. And you're up, Joe. Thank you so much. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about, you know, in complement to the presentations you've already seen, the differences between uh, you know, the RDM analysis that you saw previously and the so-called MORDM analysis that you're gonna see at the end of the webinar today. Next slide, please. So I wanna make three key points in this presentation. And kind of to start with the third one, many objective robust decision-making basically adds multi-objective evolutionary algorithm search to RDM. And by the end of the presentation, hopefully you'll have a little bit more of an understanding of what that is. And if you take a look at the figure on the right-hand side of the screen, you see this taxonomy that was developed by John Herman and others that basically talks about what each of these RDM methods has in common. And as David mentioned, there are different flavors of these bottom-up decision-making approaches. And the real focus here is going to be on that first box, that yellow box, is the creation of alternatives. And what I want to do is motivate uh, how we use MOEAs to create alternatives and also what do, we, what do we do with these multiple decision objectives that Rebecca touched on at the beginning of the talk. And so MOEAs are optimization tools that use trusted simulations and artificial intelligence to generate these planning alternatives. And then we visualize trade-offs in this different way, as you see in point two on the slide with parallel coordinate plots. Next slide, please. So just to kind of broaden this, and you've seen a couple of examples of these types of problems uh, from today, but on the right, you see a kind of generic reservoir operations problem where you have a reservoir that is releasing water to different uses and i'm taking this from a introductory overview to evolutionary algorithm optimization meyer et al uh, which i'll have a citation at the end that we worked on a couple of years ago and so when you think about all right so you are trying to manage a reservoir what do you do how, how do you do it well, you would create a reservoir release schedule. So you would have some kind of trial that you were that you were proposing, and then put that schedule into a simulation model that would use some input data that you would decide, and you run it through the model, and then you analyze results to see how that schedule performs. So how does that release schedule 
satisfy your hydropower needs, environmental protection, and so forth. And most likely the first trial is not going to do it for you, so you'd have to modify the schedule further to improve performance. Now in a decision-making context, next slide please, uh, I've added in red here what the kind of formal terminology for those different steps of the process uh, is. So decision variables or decision levers, and this touches on David's XLRM table that you saw previously. So the levers are really what kinds of actions you are changing. The relationship maps those actions to outcomes. And so here it's basically a simulation model, such as Riverware or others. And then the input data that you provide, uh, as Rebecca talked about at the beginning of the, of the session today, that is inherently uncertain. So, you know, an analyst has a decision to make about how much uncertainty to essentially include in the process. Are you using the historical record or are you, you know, using these climate change hydrologies and so forth? And then there are formal ways of basically taking the output of the model in objective functions or broadly measures and essentially trying to maximize, say, the different objective functions uh, simultaneously. Next slide, please. Now, you know, you might say to yourself, okay, well, there are different categories of decision variables that I have. Why not, why don't I just try all possibilities of the decision variables and then just whatever one is the best is going to be the best. I mean, that is, a kind of informal optimization, but it's it's pretty challenging to actually do that. So the figure that's shown in the middle of the slide is basically a generic diagram that we're going to use on one or two of these different slides here. So if you have two different decision variables, uh, X1 and X2, and then you have an objective function or measure that you are trying to maximize, the figure shows that maximizing such a function is kind of like a hill climbing operation. For those of you who like hiking, you're climbing up, uh, you know, perpendicular to the contour lines essentially on a topographic map. And so the goal of optimization is to find that global maximum basically. And again, the decision space has an unfortunate tendency to get very large very quickly. And so on table one, you see, different sort of hypothetical sizes of the decision space that we put forth in this Maillard et al. paper. And so to highlight the reservoir operation example, if you have 52 weeks in a year, which fun fact, years have 52 weeks in them, and five different levels of release for that reservoir in each one of those 52 weeks, if you look at what all the possible combinations of those numbers uh, are, it's five raised to the power of 52, which is 2.2 times 10 to the 36. Now, when I was getting ready for this, I was wondering how large of a number is this really? And it turns out that there was actually a guy who put a lawsuit in, we call this undecillion, so two undecillion dollars. He actually sued uh, a restaurant for this amount of money. And it turns out that if you charge $1,800 an hour and you worked, basically 80 hours a week, okay, for the whole uh, year, you would have to do that, every person on earth, so 7 billion people would have to do that, and then 40 billion different planets would have to do that, and they would all be working for 1,000 generations, and it still wouldn't be 2.2 times 10 to the 36 dollars. I think he lost the lawsuit, but I'm not sure. So it's a huge, almost incomprehensible number. And so you can't enumerate the whole space. You have to search the space intelligently, okay? And so in some respects, this type of optimization is like a sampling technique, but it is a very intelligent sampling technique where you wanna basically put more of the sampling effort in closer to the optimum solution. And the way that this looks is illustrated next. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so there's lots of different analogies for how evolutionary algorithm uh, optimization works. One of them that we came across in this paper was this search party analysis or search party anal analogy. So in panel A, you see an initial population. So you put the search party members evenly distributed throughout the space. 
And so there are 10 dots here, and some of them are closer to the optimum, some of them are further away, and they don't know where the optimum point is, um, but you can kind of see the optimum point is where those circles uh, close in on themselves. Again, for the hiking fans out there, it's the same thing as finding the top of a hill, basically. And so as the search process continues, those search party members combine properties with each other such that ones that are have higher fitness essentially or have a higher elevation in this analogy basically reproduce at a higher rate than ones that have lower performance and what that ends up doing is taking the population and starting to make it converge onto you know a points that are closer and closer to that optimum solution and so it's a population-based approach, which is really nice because you have this population of points. You're not just relying on one trial. You actually have multiple trials that are occurring at the same time. Now, we're talking about multi-objective problems here. So the fitness function that they're trying to climb is a little bit more complicated than just a single objective. Um, it really has to do with a kind of special combination of the decision variables that we'll kind of touch on a little bit when we talk about the parallel coordinate plots later. But the process is pretty similar. Now, this type of approach has been developed since the, you know, the early 1980s and the multi-objective approaches have been a little later than that. Maybe in the early 2000s, they were really coming into their own. But from a user perspective, it looks a little different and it's a little bit more kind of straightforward. Next slide, please. So what a user sees when they're setting up one of these things is basically the loop that is shown on the screen. And let's start with the blue arrows. The blue arrows indicate the types of the process that the, uh, a regular sort of normal simulation model water manager would be doing. So you've got decision levers, mat different management and infrastructure options, reservoir releases, um, and it could even be new infrastructure, that kind of thing, and different input scenarios that are put into a simulation model, and then that simulation model gives you a suite of different model outputs. Those model outputs can be you know, just processed as is or um, transformed into different management objectives, and the trial and error process can continue just with those blue arrows. So, you change something, see what happens, change something else, see what happens. Now, the MOEA search basically sits outside of that loop and, and does what the human would do. So in other words, the MOEA search is generating new alternatives and then using the performance of those alternatives, the objective functions, basically trying to maximize the different objective functions at the same time. And so that process continues essentially until a termination criterion. So, you know, the cool thing about it is that it is very similar to the idea of what a modeler would already be doing when they're running a simulation model. Now, one of the things that is, uh, you know, a, a common comment is like, oh, well, this sounds so complicated. It seems like it's a black box. We don't know what's going on inside of it. And even if you do not have you know, detailed insights on what the search process is doing. Remember that every single one of those candidate solutions that's put through the MOEA basically is a fully functioning uh, way to manage your system that can be analyzed in your simulation model. And our reclamation partners are doing this every day. You know, they go in and they see results from the MOEA and they're always probing further. So. There's a lot of understanding and trust that goes into this process because at the heart of it is the simulation model. And it's similar to the RDM analyses that you saw earlier where the simulation model is really like the bread and butter of this whole, um, this whole thing. Next slide, please. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about what we do with analyzing these, these multiple objectives. So I'm going to build out two different ways of plotting them, a traditional scatter plot approach and then a parallel coordinates approach. Now, before we move on, I wanna say that we have two you know, hypothetical objectives, cost and risk. We wanna minimize both of them. And so there's an ideal point shown with a star on the lower left corner. If it was possible to minimize cost and minimize risk at the same time, 
there would only be an, uh, one solution at the lower left-hand corner. Uh, next slide. But that's not the case. Uh, there is this relationship between cost and risk such that there's this cloud of points of different possibilities of combinations of them. Each one of those points is an individual solution to the problem, a management alternative. And now we need to make sense of what to do with this cloud of points. So let's pick one uh, at random. It's not really random, fun fact. Next slide. So this random one that I have just completely selected out of the blue, um, we see how it relates to the other solutions shown in the gray box. And so we call those solutions in the gray box dominated because they have higher cost and or higher risk than the solution in the lower left corner of the screen. Next slide. And when we, but when we do the analysis for the rest of the solutions, what you'll see is each one of those solutions dominates a different area of the space. And we cannot say that the solutions that remain, those those solutions with darker points, basically, you know, we 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 say that we have to just kind of accept all of them because they each offer different uh, different compromises between the two objectives. Next slide. So what we call here, these are the Pareto optimal solutions. They're also called non-dominated because they're not dominated by the rest of the solutions in the space. Next slide. Okay, so the parallel coordinates can really help us when we have uh, more than two objectives, but let's first build it out with two objectives. So I have a point on the left-hand slide, and then on the right-hand side, I have a line. Those two are equivalent, and you can see the relative magnitude of those points on the right-hand side. Next slide. So when I add another solution, now you see that we're starting to develop basically what the equivalence is between the scatter plot and the parallel coordinates. I can use the parallel coordinates to, to pick out what the dimensions of those two points are. Now, this can be a little bit confusing, but when you see later that we can use color and other kinds of things to help make sense of this. Next slide. So even without color, what you can see with the crossing lines here is that crossing lines indicate a trade-off where it is impossible to basically uh, minimize cost and risk at the same time, but you know, so solutions that have good performance and cost have poor performance and risk and vice versa. And the intuitive thing about the parallel coordinates plot is that the crossing line shows us uh, that's the case. Next slide. Hey, so, Joe. Sorry, yeah. Joe, sorry to interrupt, but you are at 15 and a half minutes right now. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so basically you can add in different objectives. So now in order to add, next slide, so now you can basically just stack up all the different objectives as you'll see in Elliot's example and show more than two objectives at the same time. Next slide. So this is what a, uh, this is what a sort of full uh, parallel coordinate plot looks like. There's different ways of doing it. We've used Tableau in the past. We've also developed uh, a software package that you can see on the screen. Next slide. Uh, go to the next slide too. Okay, and so you've already kind of seen the bottom part of this where you have uh, these different kinds of uncertainty and robustness analyses for the different alternatives. What I've hopefully shown you here is that we have added a way to um, generate multiple alternatives and then visualize the multiple dimensions sort of simultaneously at the same time. And these robustness calculations that Rebecca talked about uh, end up being different new different metrics that can be added into these types of visualizations. Next slide. Okay, and so to, so to summarize again, the contribution of MORDM is really this MODA search. And another thing to keep in mind is that this supports exploration. So even if the, the decision makers decide to implement a solution that's outside of the Pareto set, those trade-off and robustness analyses show you relationships between your designs, your performance outcomes, and your different robustness and vulnerabilities that can be really helpful in moving forward uh, in a process like this. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for teeing up Elliot, who is next with an example application of MORDM
or several steps of MLRDM to our basin. Elliot Alexander is a hydrologic engineer with the Bureau of Reclamation's Upper Colorado Region and is currently on assignment at CADS West. His present work activities include researching long-term operation policies in the Colorado River Basin, using a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm, performing hydrologic and salinity analysis using the Colorado River Simulation System riverware model, and assisting in the consumptive uses and losses reporting for the Upper Colorado River Basin. And you are now up, Elliot. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Elliot Alexander, and I am here to talk to you about generating and identifying robust Lake Mead operating policies. Uh, before I begin my talk, I will want to acknowledge contributors to this research. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Chris Breisick and Dr. Zagona from CU Boulder and CADS West. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Prairie, Carly Durla, Alan Butler, and Dr. Smith for your help with this work. Uh, next slide, please. In the early 2000s, a continuous drought prompted the need for the 2007 interim guidelines. The 2007 interim guidelines defined lower basin shortage and surplus conditions, it incentivized lower basin conservation measures, and it defined the coordination operation of Lake Powell and Lake Mead. During the development of the 2007 interim guidelines, hundreds of unique operational alternatives were generated and five candidate alternatives were evaluated in the final EIS. This research explores an innovative approach to generate and evaluate thousands of new Lake Mead operating policies and then focuses on identifying robust policies. Next slide, please. This research was initiated in 2016 and it evolved into my master's thesis project where Dr. Kasprizic advised me on. Today, I'm going to focus on two components of this project, which includes how to use a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm to efficiently design and test thousands of policies, and how to evaluate robustness by simulating MOEA-generated policies across a wide range of future conditions. And I want to make the point that this research is focuses on only Lake Mead operating policies. Next slide, please. So before I jump into explaining how an MOEA is applied in this research, I want to take some time to discuss the conventional way of evaluating Lake Mead operating policies using the CRSS model. So this schematic shows the modeling setup for a generalized CRSS run. You have a input hydrology and water demand scenario, and you also have a formulation on how Lake Mead will operate in the future. You then run this formulation through the CRSS model. Uh, next slide. And you get a suite of model outputs. And these model outputs can vary from pool elevation, reservoir release, diversions, and you can formulate this model output to be multiple measures of system performance or objectives that you're trying to meet. For a given formulation of Lake Mead policy, if you aren't satisfied with that policy's performance, you would have to go back into the first step, reformulate the policy, re-simulate it in the model, and see if those um, incremental changes led to incremental improvement in your objectives. If if it didn't, you'd have to resort to a process similar to trial and error to tweak the process. Next slide. A new way to generate and evaluate operating policies is to pair the CRSS model with an MOEA. This process starts off with an initial population of operating the policies to test in the CRSS model. The MOEA is formulated to change the operating policy for Lake Mead in three separate ways. It can first set two types of surplus operating tiers. It can also change the size and number of shortage operating tiers, setting up to six discrete shortage tier at lower Lake Mead pool elevations. 
And lastly, the MOEA can set shortage volume ranging from zero kiloacre feet to 2,400 kiloacre feet in the created shortage tier. Uh, next slide. This initial population of MOEA generated policies are then individually simulated in the CRSS model with an assumption of an input hydrology and water demand scenario. The model output for each run is formulated to be multiple measures of performance objectives. Uh, next slide. And the next step is that the MOEA judges the set of generated policies by their multiple objective values, and it is intelligent enough to distinguish good performing policies from poor performing policies and then it takes a set of good performing policies to generate new policies to test through, through CRSS. So this search loop iterates thousands of times, resulting in a strong perform, a set of strong performing operating policies, which can be compared with respect to the trade-offs and their objective values. Uh, next slide. The MOEA is set up to solve an eight objective problem formulation. The objectives represent base and wide performance metrics that are closely tied to system health through incorporating critical reservoir pool elevation, duration, frequency, and quantity of shortage reduction. These objectives are based off metrics de developed in the 2012 basin study. An example of an objective used in this analysis is Powell 3490. In this objective, you want to minimize the time that monthly Lake Powell pool elevation is less than 3,490 feet of elevation. In this analysis, all eight objectives are minimizing, therefore lower values mean better performance. Next slide. And so a way of show the trade-off in the objective values between the policy is through presenting parallel coordinate plots in which Gerald just previously showed. This is a, an example parallel coordinate plot showing the first two objectives of this analysis, and it displays three policies from the 2007 interim guidelines. The blue line represents the water supply alternative which is a policy that maximizes water deliveries and expense of retaining water and storage. The green line represents the reservoir storage alternative and a policy that keeps more water and storage through increasing shortage volume. And the red line is uh, the recommended operating policy of Lake Mead from the guidelines and it has less shortage reduction than the reservoir storage alternative. So this two objective parallel coordinate plot has preferred performance downward and you can see that these lines cross, meaning there's trade-off in performance. The reservoir storage alternative does better in the first objective by keeping meat above 1,000, but it does this at the expense of imposing a higher duration of shortage. Uh, next slide, please. And so expanding this parallel coordinate to show all eight objectives, you can start to see the range of performance achieved by these three um, interim guideline policies. Next slide. And so through expanding it to show all eight objectives, you can now see the interim guideline policies with in colored lines and the MOEA generated policies in the gray lines and you can see the range of performance achieved. Um, this plot shows per preferred performance downward. So an optimal operating policy would be a horizontal line at the bottom of this plot. Um, this, an optimum policy wasn't achieved in this analysis. However, what was achieved is that the MOEA generated policies, the gray lines, explored a wider range of the solutions place uh, than the colored lines and the MOEA generated policy also helps us fill in the gaps between these three interim guideline policies, giving you a, set, a large set of strong performing policies to learn from. This MOEA search was set up 
to evaluate 7,500 policies and it discovered 751 non-diamonding operating policies, which is shown in the gray lines here. Uh, next slide. So switching gears to the robustness part of this work, uh, the first step of evaluating the robustness of the MOEA generated policies is to test these policies across many future conditions. In this step, the 751 MOEA generated policies are re-simulated across two water supply scenarios and three demand scenarios. The water supply scenarios consist of the 107 traces from the full observed hydrology ensemble and 112 traces from the sediment three ensemble. The water dem demand scenarios consist of the official 2007 demand schedule and the slow growth and rapid growth from the 2012 basin study. So this step resulted in nearly 500,000 simulations, and this provided a rich data set that documents the range of performance of, across, of these MOEA-generated policies across the many features tested. Next slide. And this rich data set, you can use the data provided in this data set to help you quantify the robustness of these generated policies. This analysis used a satisfying measure of robustness, and we defined the robustness criteria to be as follows. If a policy keeps Lake Mead above 1,000 greater than 90% of the time, while also keeping Lake Powell above 3490 greater than 95% of the time, while also um, imposing an average annual, annual shortage volume less than or equal to 600 kiloacre feet, then that policy is robust in a given supply and demand feature. If a policy meets these performance requirements in all the futures tested, then the policy would have a 100% robustness score. Next slide. And so now I'm going to show a result of this robustness analysis. And this is a image of a Tableau dashboard. The top plot is the same parallel coordinate plot that you saw before. Now the lines are colored to indicate each of the policies robustness score, which range from 17% to 53%, which is a green. The bottom um, plot shows the Lake Mead operating policy structure for all these um, generated policies. And in the next slide, I'm going to show uh, a resultant of filtering this Tableau workbook, which is an interactive data visualization tool to show the highly robust policies. Uh, next slide. And so this filtering resulted in finding um, policies with high robust scores, which are the R1 and R2 policies, and this filtering also shows the three previously mentioned interim guideline policies. You can see in the top right of this dashboard, I've highlighted the R1 and R2 policies, and you can see that based on the shade of green and the, the size of the bar chart, they have a higher robust score based on this robustness criteria than the three um, interim guideline policies. If you look in the bottom left, you can start to see the operation um, structure of the R1 and R2 policies. And this type of robustness anal analysis is powerful because you can learn from the operating similarities between the highly robust policies to learn from which op operation attributes lead to robust performance. Um, next slide. And so another way to visualize robustness is uh, is this plot, and this plot shows the MOEA generated policies um, in the gray bar plots ranked from high to low robustness scores. And this plot also shows the the interim three interim guideline policies in the same color as used before. And so applying this type of robustness analysis 
to the MOA generated policies provides you a way to rank and sort these policies by their ability to meet these robustness criteria. And it provides an intuitive way to compare these policies and also an intuitive way to condense a large set of information into a meaningful score. I um, want to also point out that the um, R1 and R2 policies achieve a higher level of robustness than the inner guideline policies and the reservoir storage alternative um, had the highest robust score out of the three policies. And so next slide. And so in summary, showed how linked a CRSS model to the MOEA to efficiently search for diverse, high-quality Lake Mead operating policies using performance metrics developed by in the basin study to show that tested policies in potential scenarios to account for significant uncertainties in future hydrology and demand scenarios. We use important system performance criteria to define robustness and determine that many MOEA policies were more robust than those tests in the 2007 interim guidelines. And I'd like to mention that additional research to inform the remaining components of this MORDM analysis is currently underway. And those include updating the uncertainty ensemble and identifying vulnerabilities using uh, the scenario discovery that uh, analysis that David and Alan mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so thank you uh, for your attention. Thanks, Elliot. And wait, Keely, before you end the show, um, there's a couple of questions that we could use Elliot's, one of Elliot's last slides to answer. Oh, wow, we're back at the beginning. Um, the slide with the gray bars and the three alternatives at the very end. Okay, so Elliot, um, a couple questions for you. First, can you elaborate on why a desirable policy might have a low robustness score? For example, the water supply alternative is lowest on the y-axis, but has a low robustness score. Yeah, good question. Um, so the water supply alternative, as I said earlier, maximizes water deliveries. And so it does this by not imposing shortage reductions at lower Lake Mead pool elevations. And so this policy has a low robustness score because it was only able to meet this robustness criteria in favorable hydrology. And where it failed to meet this robustness criteria is when anytime the water supply stressed the system. Thanks, Elliot. And um, about that criteria, you used three of the eight objectives and you used certain thresholds. And can you explain why or is that flexible? Yeah, good question. Um, so this robustness criteria was determined by a process of testing and it this robustness criteria in the satisficing analysis is flexible meaning that you can use multiple different definitions of robustness in terms of different performance measures and in different performance measures thresholds so it is flexible and can easily be updated based on your preferences Okay, thanks, Elliot. And uh, last question while we're on this slide. Do you have a sense of where DCP would sit on this spectrum? Yeah, so DCP wasn't um, tested in this framework, but based on the shortage volumes, I would say it was most similar to the reservoir storage alternative. So it would be somewhere near that green line you see on the left side of the plot. Okay, thank you. And we have questions for other presenters. I'll start with Dr. Kasprizik. You mentioned briefly that um, having this set of policies can 
provide insights into other relationships. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Yeah, I think that it's a, it's kind of a situation where, you know, going into it, um, and maybe one of Elliot's slides could be a good, you know, visual aid for this, but I mean that you don't know, you can't really like articulate a priori what the relationship between those different objectives really is going to be, um, you know, by putting the trade-off in Tableau and being able to start playing the games with the filtering and that kind of thing, you can start to see, you know, you can start to answer questions like, you know, how much, uh, like how much of a degradation in performance on objective A am I going to see if I want to minimize objective B and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, like all of those non-dominated points give you this kind of rich database to start answering questions like that um, more so than just kind of looking at the relationship only among a few different, um, you know, solutions because there isn't going to be that kind of continuous sort of relationship among the objectives if you only have like a couple of solutions to look at. Right, thanks. And you also mentioned, you know, perhaps you don't use a solution that the MOEA found, but I guess you could, it would be helpful to understand where a different solution kind of fits in the trade off space since you have that space defined by the MOEA, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, and I guess like another thing that that su such a, a kind of learning process is also used for the decision variables you know so like you get to kind of see what the most important decision variables are so i mean if you wanted to tweak one of the decision variable values beyond what you saw in the optimization i mean there's nothing stopping you from doing that um hopefully you get a sense for those sensitivities of what the most important decision variable values are okay so it sounds like it it contributes a lot of valuable context and info to the more traditional process, regardless of whether the MOEA finds the magic solution. I'd say that, yes. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so for Alan, the Basin study was non-decisional, but can you reflect on how using RDM provided insights about the Basin or about the type of information that could be valuable for planning? Sure. Um, at least to me, I think that the introducing the concept of the vulnerable conditions and using that to characterize which sequences, string flow sequences or future sequences provide problems um, is definitely beneficial so you can get away from uh, the debate of which particular hydrology scenario is best or most appropriate. You can just use all of them and then hone in on those that uh, cause cause vulnerabilities to the system. And then I also think um, some of the visualization type, uh, the visualizations that were introduced make it a lot easier to understand trade-offs. Um, we looked at some of those in the Basin study, and then Elliot and, and Dr. Kasparizic introduced several others. But you can you can only look at so many 10, 50, 90 plots with eight different colored lines, um, and and get much out of it. So looking at the the trade offs in different ways is is beneficial, I think. Okay, thank you. And then Dr. Groves, uh, kind of building on that question, you applied DMDU and RDM specifically in many planning contexts. Can you comment on increasing awareness about DMDU and deep uncertainty and how other organizations have recognized the benefits of this type of information? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, definitely there's been pretty dramatic up, uptake of these kinds of um, approaches over the last uh, you know, 10 years or so, I, I'd say. Um, you know, I think the, you know, 
the Monterey, the Monterey, Mexico case. Well, first of all, there's there's a bunch of applications um, promoted by the or supported by the World Bank and the Inter American Development Bank in in, in uh, non non U.S. contexts. Um, and those are nice because um, you know we you know just provides a, a funding mechanism for trying out these new approaches. And and so the, the Monterey case is actually one that wasn't funded that way, but um, the I think the the nice thing about that study is that and that and that application was that this was a region that was thinking about a particular solution as a, a, a very um, contentious um, conveyance facility from southern the southern portion of Mexico into the northern portion of Mexico as as being the, uh, the you know the approach to meet rising demand in Monterey Mexico area and through uh, you know taking a fresh look at the uncertainties and, and using the RDM approach, they actually, you know, moved away from that as being their primary, um, you know, their primary goal, uh, objective or uh, solution, and and rather uh, moved to some to a much more diverse integrated management approach where um, they identified a series of actions to take now, and then they would only do that um, larger project if the conditions evolved in a particular way that the analysis told them, um, and so that was actually very you know, very effective. I mean, RDM, in, in fact, you know, changed their whole um, water policy. Um, Metropolitan Water District, I, I suspect there might be some folks from from, from Met, Met on the line here. Um, Metropolitan's been using this approach as kind of um, sort of to complement its uh, standard integrated resources uh, or their, its IRP process. Um, so essentially, you were developing, you know, a a, a strategy for its IRP and then and then using RDM to sort of stress test that and understand you know in what conditions would that IRP some of the adaptations identified in the IRP need to take um, need to be implemented so um, it, you know I think that's a real um, another piece of evidence of, of, of uptake and then um, you know and then there's a lot of other research groups um, that are also using this um, in the east you know to help um, look at water management and um, in you know North Carolina, et cetera. So um, anyway, maybe I'll stop there. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, that's good to mm -hmm. have that Monterey example of an, a, basically a documentable shift in where they were planning on going. And then also thinking about how this approach enables a stepwise kind of consideration of activities or policies or plans that, you know, might seem hard to digest, but you can do it piecewise if they become necessary. Um, okay, a couple of other questions. First, I think maybe I'll pitch this to Joe. Is there a limitation on the number of objectives that could be included in these analyses? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think that, you know, and if you look at some of the decision, if you look at some of the other decision, uh, analytic kind of approaches. There's different sorts of hierarchies among, you know, different decision metrics and that kind of thing. So in other words, like if you have a problem that has, you know, 20 or 30 different metrics or something like that, that you've identified, I mean, I think that there is a way to kind of, you know, put that into kind of a hierarchical framework so that you can, uh, you know, that you can kind of prioritize them. From a mathematical perspective, there is a limit of around 10 objectives, and part of the reason for that, and I can talk to whoever offline about this, but there, it's basically easier to, to meet that non-domination criterion the more objectives that you have, because you only need to be better in one objective and that kind of thing. So around 10 things start to break down. But like I said, I mean, if you kind of combine this with other types of sort of MCDA approaches, you know, where you're like sort of prioritizing your objectives and kind of, you know, what I would suggest is like try to get like 10 representative objectives, say uh, you can optimize on certain objectives and then calculate other objectives that you're not optimizing. So, I mean, so there is the limit of 10, but it's not like a hard limit. There are ways around it. Yeah, that makes sense. And like you were saying, just because you don't optimize necessarily for certain objectives doesn't mean you can't bring them into the analysis and see trade-offs um, at a later portion. Okay, thank you. Um, so we invited Jeff Lucas and Liz Payton to be kind of panelists because 
we thought there might be some need or benefit to reflect back on the state of the science report. And I'm going to take that opportunity by uh, asking if you can kind of review some of the factors that became clear, especially in this volume four, the long-term hydrology, that, you know, kind of point to the difficulties of thinking about long-term planning in the basin. Maybe I'll pitch to Jeff and he may end up pitching to Liz too. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. And, and thanks to everyone for being on this uh, really interesting webinar. I wasn't familiar with all the examples of application of robust decision making and other uh, decision support approaches. So, you know, as we were writing, um, you know, chapter, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and then the particularly the volume intro to chapter 4, which um you know kind of follows on some concepts that that came up as as uh the group of authors involved with the 2014 climate change in colorado report were you know trying to conclude that report you know it, it is a, a challenge that we have the the you could say we have this this great um you know advantage over water planners 20 or 30 years ago in that we have this now profusion of different you know supplemental sources of of planning hydrologies from both paleohydrology and then and then climate change informed or climate change projected hydrology um, but they have you know different characteristics and you can't say a priori you know which which one is the most appropriate uh the most truthful to the future which has yet to occur and so um you know this is also you know hastened you know the, the development and need to apply these uh, types of approaches that the speakers have been talking about today of um you know really you know not trying to single out a, a single most probable future or even a subset of most probable futures and and kind of turn the question around and ask you know how do we develop um, approaches to identify system vulnerabilities and and strategies and options um, that help us uh, you know obtain the best outcomes given you know the wide range of vulnerabilities and and futures that could occur so uh, you know as 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 keely said or I, I guess it was seth who, who mentioned starting us off that you know the report you know did not uh, explore these these new approaches and there were a couple reasons for that i mean it kind of deserves its own you know systematic uh, report and synthesis of the the great progress that's been made uh, across these different decision-making approaches under uncertainty, um, but we, you know, we had an eye. You know, we're kind of mindful of of this state of the evolving state of practice, um, and so it's really nice to see this this webinar as a as a follow-up to what we didn't say, couldn't really say in the report itself. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Liz, no pressure. Do you want to add anything? Well, sure. Um, it, it is a really fascinating webinar. And the thing that keeps striking me is the the idea of throwing all of these potential hydrologies in as inputs and wondering, you know, if there's going to be a, uh, some push to call some of those hydrologies out and how that might look and, uh, you know, if there's going to be some interest in really trying to assign some confidence to certain sets <laughs> and none to, not to others and that kind of thing and how that all may fit into uh, your analysis so that's not really reporting on the report <laughs> but it is something that just strikes me after uh, working on volume four so yeah thanks we're all waiting with bated breath to see what reclamation will do. Rebecca? Um, let me, so that was my personal question, but let me get back to some audience questions first. For Joseph and Elliot, with 10 objectives, or in Elliot's case, he used eight, does this cause issues with 
multiple robust policies resulting in no clear direction. Uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I think that like the, the number of objectives doesn't directly relate to how you're going to find, uh, you know, what solutions end up being robust. I mean, I, I think that one nuance might be that, you know, Elliot, and if you wanted to show Elliot slides, I don't know, um, if you're able to do that, uh, you know, we have the objectives that we put together, you know, and then there is a question of negotiating from among those different solutions that, that balance those different objectives, which policies are of interest. And then I think that in these studies, we've been looking at calculating the robustness of all of the solutions. And then, I mean, really what he was showing was a ranking of the different robust um, solutions, you know, in that last, you know, that CDF kind of thing. Uh, that was shown at the end. So, I mean, I would one of the things that you look at when you're kind of looking at such a thing as this is like, I, I think that the range, you know, the kind of 50 some percent to 20 some percent, I mean, that range is interesting. In other words, like if you're if you're generating a lot of solutions and in fact, like, you know, you know, if you're generating a lot of solutions, it could be a situation where all of them are near robust or none of them are robust. And that is something that's really valuable to learn. You know what I mean? In the sense that I know that like with Rand, the stuff that they did in Pittsburgh, you know what I mean? It was, it was, there was a really hard, you know, the combined sewer overflow target, it was really hard to meet and, and, and you can create a bunch of alternatives and then it's really tough to meet a particular um, target, you know? So, I, so there's an aspect of that as well is that, you know, again, there's this kind of exploration, like, the set of alternatives that you generate either by hand or through optimization, you, you put them through this robustness analysis to really see like where are they all at? Even if you were to manage the system in a number of different myriad ways, do you know how, what, what does the score end up looking like across all of the different uh, alternatives? And I mean, you can see here that there are a number, there are a lot of policies that have pretty similar scores with respect to robustness. Um, so, you know, there's like the aspect of choosing things with respect to robustness, but then also looking at those objectives. I mean, sometimes the solutions may not have the best performance with respect to objectives, but they are robust and vice versa. So it's really all about like getting in and trying to explore those sets. And I mean, it, even David touched on this, you know, we would have liked to have been able to show some more kind of interactive uh, plots and some of those are available online for you guys to, to, to kind of explore more. Can I, can I add one, one thing, um, Rebecca, you know, sort of at the, at the, one of the foundational principles of, of the, all this kind of, kind of analysis is this notion of deliberation with analysis, which, you know, essentially is saying that there is no one right robust answer. Um, I mean, any of these analyses that you, you can't point to the best solution because it depends on your perspective. Um, what the analysis is trying to do is sort through all the information to tell you things like, well, what would you need to believe in order to favor a particular policy or a strategy or another particular strategy? But that ultimately then leaves it up to the decision makers to determine, you know, how much stock do they want to put in uh, a particular set of, uh, you know, climate traces or, or hydrologic traces, for instance. Um, and this actually gets gets back to the point that was just made about whether or not reclamation or, you know, water managers should try to call the different hydrologies to a, you know, a smaller number. Um, I would just caution that that one of the nice things about having a lot of traces is that you can really determine where the thresholds are for performance and understand what characteristics drive good and bad performance. And if you call the, you know, the, the sequences too soon or the traces too soon, then you lose that information. And so, um, you know, it's kind of a balance, obviously, um, between having too much information and, and not having the information that you need. Yeah, good points to bring up, David. And I'll just add my two cents, which is that the important part, and, and this is maybe restating or being a little more broad about what's been said, but the important part of this is that we'd need, or we, we would like to have 
different information because of this uncertainty. And none of it, you know, none of these techniques and none of this information at all takes the place of the um, less technical components of what goes into making a plan or a policy. But it is nice to have this information because we can't, you know, necessarily choose a hydrology or a demand sequence or anything. And so um, really that's the point. It, it bolsters and enhances planning uh, rather than giving us direct answers or replacing any other processes that might go on. Um, I think we'll do one more question. And it's, could the presenters speak to the importance of the models slash relationships that are used in these procedures? For example, how modeling uncertainties are considered. And I would add on to that, um, the importance of establishing a trusted model, even though any model will include uncertainties. And um, maybe Joe and Dave and, I mean, anyone, okay, just whoever wants to weigh in on that. I'm happy to weigh in, but I take my turn too. Let, well, let me let me just start by, by saying that the, uh, the very early work on this type of uh, these approaches, these, these DMDU approaches, um, identified model uncertainty as one of the critical uncertainties. Um, some of the very early work looked at, well, what do you do when you have a case where one group of researchers has one model that gives one answer and another group of researchers has another model that gives another answer? So, um, you know, the idea behind using, you know, DMDU or RDM in that context is to say, well, each model encapsulates a different set of assumptions, you know, maybe not assumptions about demand or hydrology, but assumptions about how you construct a representation of the system. And it's difficult to know which model is right, although you, of course, you can validate them and according to different metrics, et cetera. But, um, you know, the way that, you know, we generally approach this is, is if there are two credible models that represent a system or multiple models, you, you can you know, create additional scenarios that are based on one model or the other. And then again, the point of the analysis then is to understand what would you need to believe in order to choose one strategy or another strategy. You might find a strategy that works well, regardless of how you model, whether you use model A or B, or you might find another strategy where it's really dependent. It's, it performs well only if you're using model B and under certain scenarios. And at some point you can't, you know, uh, eliminate the uncertainty, but at least the analysis helps you identify what uncertainty is most critical. Is it the model choice of models or is it the choice of assumptions about hydrology or is it some combination of the both? Thanks, Dave. Any other comments? Well, I'll weigh in. <laughs> But was someone else going to speak up? No, go ahead. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I, I agree with Dave. And and yes, the point is that we can't be certain about many things. But the question is, can we do some analysis and probe it later on? And the fact that we have this longstanding basin model, CRSS, which is trusted and maintained and improved um, provides an advantage for the starting point for developing you know plans and policies which we can probe later rather than having any you know major controversy about which model to use um, any anything else quick to add Joe uh, I, I guess the comment I was just going to make is that, like, I think, it, 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 and David's right, I think in different contexts, you, it's decently obvious to see sort of the impact of the uncertainties. I mean, here, the hydrologic uncertainty is so large that, you know, I mean, I think that qualitatively, you could probably say that the impact of the hydrologic uncertainty is probably higher than the impact of the model uncertainty in this particular case. but um, you know, it depends a lot on on the kind of physics of the system that you're working on and that kind of thing. I mean, the Colorado River Basin being so highly managed and everything, I think it's helpful to have CRSS because it 
it has a decent fidelity to the the way that the system is managed. True, Joe. Thank you. Um, okay, with that, I am going. Thank you, everyone, for attending and for the great questions. And also, I'm not sure if DK is still here, but we are going to answer the question about paleo conditioned offline. So, okay, Seth. Great. Hey, thanks, Rebecca. Um, really want to say again, thank you to you and all of our speakers today for a great conversation about this field of study. And I think you've really provided a good foundation for folks on this webinar to understand the value of these approaches and, and how they have been used to answer some real critical um, management uh, uh, questions that folks out in this similar type of water resource landscape that we find ourselves in um, so often day to day here and just uh, uh, really looking forward to the next set of conversations about this and other topics. I um, want to say that uh, these presentations today and our prior webinar presentations are all available upon request. If you want, you can email Keeley Brooks on the email um, that's provided on the screen right now, and she can provide those to you. Um, <clears throat> also, just want to thank um, the Colorado River Climate and Hydrology Workgroup partners who, you know, are the folks who are driving this conversation and investigation of these kinds of topics um, for us to uh, ultimately resolve some of these uncertainties and, and understand these issues in a lot more detail. So really, thank you to all of you all that are on the call and um, those who have been participating in various uh, uh, projects and things like that as well. Um, thank you to you as well. And so I um, want to say thank you for your time today. And this concludes our third webinar presentation regarding the Colorado River Hydrology Research Symposium. And I hope everyone out there stays healthy and safe. So have a great day.